Okay. Um, Hi everyone, thanks very much for coming and sorry for the bit delay with some technical problems. So it is my pleasure to um, introduce, briefly introduce uh, Christina Turner, who came to us to deliver a very promising seminar. Um, with a background, uh, Christina did her PhD at the University of Copenhagen and then uh, continued to do postdocs at the Osservatorio Astronomico di Bre Brega in Milano and the uh, Instituto de Astronomia de Granada. Uh, which she was for several years. So now, please start. Thank you very much. Buen día a todos. Eh, eh, muy complicado del año pasado. Eh, muy complicado para la oportunidad de uh, presentar un palabra un poco de lo que me trabajo. I'm going to stop my, my Portuguese here because I only have an official P1 in Portuguese. <laughs> but I like the language very much. So I'm going to continue later. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about explosive transients. So anything that's usually stars or kind of stellar objects exploding in the universe um, and the host galaxies and how we can find out what the progenitors and what the properties of these explosions are, both from the actual explosions and from the host galaxy. Uh, well, in the background, you see a picture that I took in the first time I was in Lisbon, actually almost exactly 10 years ago. Uh, in the square that you probably all know in front of the of the ruins of the cathedral that was ruined in the big earthquake. Um, in the last slide you're going to see the picture that is the midnight. Um, so yeah, I'm actually physically still living in Granada. I have been working there for almost 12 years. Um, I'm now affiliated at the Czech Academy of Science in Andreas Observatory of Prague. Um, but I'm not actually working there because they also don't pay me. So I'm at the moment I'm well in the labor type of sense, I'm unemployed. And um, if you want to put it nicely, I'm a freelance scientist. It's less exciting than you than you might think. <laughs> okay, let's get to the science. If my computer collaborates, I don't know what's wrong with this. Project. I only have a 10-year-old computer, that might be part of the problem. Um, okay, so I'm going to make a short introduction on stellar explosions and the type of things I'm, uh, I mostly study. I guess most of you are not too familiar with that kind of subject, so um, I guess we do a lot of theory and, and, and communication and that kind of thing. Um, so one of the, well, the main events that I'm studying are called gamma ray bursts. So these are, it can be, well, there are two types of objects. One is a massive star that's collapsing into a black hole. It has to be a rapidly rotating star um, in order not to collapse directly to a black hole, but actually to form an accretion disk and two powerful, highly relativistic jets while it's collapsing. So that event is very short from a few seconds to, well, it can last a few minutes or um, well, very rare cases a few hours, um, but it's a very short phenomenon. And there is another um, type of object that produces a very similar phenomenon in some differences, but also an accretion to a jet, which is the collapse or the, the, the collapse, the coalescence of two compact objects, uh, mostly two neutral stars. So for now, we have seen, you can see a gamma ray burst from the collapse of two neutron stars, maybe also black hole neutral star merging from this that we haven't seen that yet. But, uh, um, so how do we know that? Well, for the so-called long gamma ray bursts, there's some distinction, sort of an artificial line, uh, if the how long the the ninety percent of the energy takes to be released of larger than two seconds, that we call a long burst. If it's more than less than two seconds, that we call a short burst. Um, and we know that these long bursts are connected to broad line one C supernovae. So those are supernovae um, stars that have lost the hydrogen and the helium envelope. Um, and broadline is because they have very high expansion velocities. If you observe their spectral lines, they are broadened by the, the um, high velocity of the of the photosphere that gets it from the supernova. Sorry, and equal two seconds. Uh, larger than two seconds. And well, and no, well, it's a cloud of distribution, so there is no real equal. <laughs> and if you have a, a GRB that's at two seconds, you are like. Uh, is it a long or a short? So, in the more experiments, it's more clear, but the dividing line is not, it's, it's artificial. Also, you have to, well, originally, the like, dividing line was made in observer frame, and these things have redshifts from zero to 
nine, what we know so far. So that's not necessarily the best frame duration. Um, okay. And we know they're connected to star from the host, so we'll come back to that in a lot. Um, and since a few years, we know that this um, short um, hard gamma repress is called, uh, so called soft and long because of the, the shape of the high energy radiation. Um, they produce an event called a kilonova, which is a kind of red supernova, fainter than a normal supernova. Um, and they are found in all kinds of host galaxies. And the big thing is why we know that this type of object will be it because we detected a uh, gamma ray burst coincident with a gravitational wave signal um, in August 2017. So this was the, the very smoking gun. Um, on that. Unfortunately, we haven't um, been able to do that since, um, but everyone is ramping up observations. At the moment, the gravitational wave detectors are not online. We're going to go online maybe at the end of the year. And everyone is ramping up trying to get counterparts in the electromagnetic range um, of these, of more of them. Um, yeah, and uh, one thing that I can explain about um, on the spectrum. Um, which is very interesting for observations. I already said that there are all kinds of redshifts. Um, you see here the, a very high redshift with the number of the more. Um, so concerning that the, the spectrum that you observe from this um, from the gamma ray bursts, um, so you have two types of emission. You have the thing called prompt emission, um, that is shocks um, that are created by well material that's detected at slightly different uh, Lorentz factors. You don't talk about velocity anymore because they're so high. Because it's even light. Um, in these internal shocks, uh, they produce the gamma radiation. And once the jet slams into the interstellar medium, you produce the so-called afterglow, and that is observed anything from X-rays down to radio. Um, the longer the wavelengths, the later you observe the, the afterglow. Um, and the nice things for observations is to, to use them to study other things that are in the way between the gamma burst and us. Is that the intrinsic spectrum is a synchrotron spectrum with some um, well, characteristic breaks, a characteristic frequency. Um, and in between, you have smooth power laws. So anything that's in between and material by something that's in between um, is not, so you don't have an intrinsic shape that you have to correct, for example, if you observe distant quasars. Um, and observe the material that's either inside the quasar or, or in the sideline, then you have to uh, subtract the actual composition of the quasar. You don't have to call it here. Um, and here, the green thing is usually very observed by the activity um, for the mass. You want, okay. Um, and well, there's a, a huge zoo of the um, Types of supernovae, which is actually a plot that's starting to get outdated because we have discovered more <laughs> as any supernova person knows. Um, and so, some other very massive explosions that I'm, I'm uh, working on are so called supernova supernovae. There are also two types um, for the same classification as for normal supernova type one, don't show hydrogen in the picture, type two, do. Um, they might be powered by magnetars. We don't know yet the mechanism why these supernovae are uh, very luminous, uh, more luminous than the normal supernovae, which you see here on this plot. And so there's some sort of, well, this is an artificial threshold, um, but it seems to occur there as well that there are some explosions that are actually much more luminous than others um, at minus 21 in this magnitude. So, sorry, sure. We know where it's going from. Which slope? The uh, exponential decay has some time with one. You mean the, the power law of yeah. the decay? It's not a power law, is it? Is that a power law for GRD? No, this is not. Okay, maybe. So this is light curve. Of, this is actually a plot from a, from a red hue and superluminal supernova. Yeah. Um, so this is light curves of supernovae and supernovae. Uh, well, I don't know if this is a sort of fits. This is just indicating where the peak magnitude of GRD supernovae is. This is not this is not any light curve. This is just a, a, a indication in, in the y axis. Um, and so yeah, they are very luminous, but they're not as um, um, 
while they're not detectable as far out as GRBs, GRB supernovae are actually rather difficult to detect above redshift 0.8 or so, one maybe. The thing is that we detect the gamma radiation from the jet, so we can detect those things much further out in the universe. Um, and you see the supernova, supernova despite their luminosity um, above redshift one or so, it also gets difficult to detect them. But they are very interesting objects. At some point, we thought um, because the host galaxies might be similar and that they might come from kind of similar kind of stars, maybe with slight differences, uh, probably not. As I said, we still don't know what they're powered um, by, maybe by magnetars. And that um, well, got the people doing fast radio bursts interested, which is another type of very mysterious object. It's a spike in radio that has been discovered like the first time maybe 10 years ago. Um, and no one knows what those really are. Um, we know that at least from one galactic magnetar, we have observed a fast radio burst. So maybe yeah. I mean, like related to magnetars, if those objects are powered by magnetars, maybe there's no connection with them. But that's still like here. <coughs> okay, so something which I said I'm very interested in is to um, derive properties of the progenitor star or system. I do less short GRBs, I do more uh, anything related to collapse of a massive star um, to find out what kind of star exploded. So the supernova community has been very successful to do that in the local universe, mostly for the, let's say, supernova types that come from smaller stars, um, 8, 10, 15 solar masses. Um, because what they're doing is they're using HST images that are there from before the explosion, because HST is monitoring a lot of galaxies for a lot of different reasons. Um, and the, the resolution is high enough, if you're lucky enough and you don't have, you're not just observing the center of the galaxy, to actually single out stars. Um, so in an ideal case, you have an observation of a supernova field where the supernova exploded before explosion. You see the supernova exploding. And um, afterwards, you see that the source that you had before has actually disappeared. So you know it was a big thing that it has disappeared. Um, for many of the of these stellar explosions I've been talking about, GRBs, you know, supernovae, um, also any type of yeah, supernova 1b, supernova 1c, are also very tricky. Uh, also because they are more rare, and you have to go to really nearby galaxies because otherwise you don't resolve them in stars. And so what you have to do is try to indirectly infer things from the environment or the host galaxies you are really so unlucky that you cannot observe the immediate environment. Um, so for well for GRBs, um, the, the main problem is that they are all very far away. The closest GRB has been 40 megaparsecs, but that's for GRB. The closest long GRB I think was 160 megaparsecs. You can single out stars with HST about 30 megaparsecs if you're lucky 50. So there you see that the GRB is there to chat. And the other problem is that GRBs and also superluminous supernova usually occur in dwarf galaxies, and they are very rarely <laughs> by chance in the field of view of Hubble. So you usually don't have uh, free imaging. Um, that's, that's the second problem. So what I'm trying to do is use something called integral field spectroscopy. Um, so you do spectroscopy of, let's say, a galaxy or a part of a galaxy, and you get a spectrum in each of your pixels, then called voxels. So it's if you would take a slice of your of your data cube, it would look like an image of that wavelength, but you have all the spectral information. Sorry. Yeah, yes. Sound that well, the, the even if you had, and well, I said GRBs are usually very far. Even if they would be monitored by chance with Hubble, you cannot single out a star in those galaxies. Uh, Supernovae and supernova are also still very rare objects, but they are slightly closer than the average distance. But it's very unlikely that you by chance have observed the host galaxy before it exploded because it's a dwarf galaxy. Hubble observes, well, they take the Hubble archive, Hubble has observed basically all of the nearby spiral galaxies, for example. There's Hubble data on that of different quality, different wave bands. Um, it can happen at some point, but the probability is very low because we don't have. We would need like a, a 
haplotype full sky survey. But we don't have that. So because you need resolution, the problem is the resolution, the, the spatial resolution. Otherwise, you don't see much at all. Um, yeah, and so what you can do, so you get, um, so you can measure all kinds of emission lines. So there's a lot of emission lines in the, in the warm gas of the galaxy, um, excited by stars, for example. Um, and you can determine different properties of the gas from observing these emission lines or ratios of these emission lines, uh, like metallicity. Um, you can even get an, a hint on the age of the, of the star. Um, the age can also be done by a much more uh, sophisticated modeling by actually modeling the spectrum. Um, you can get the dust extinction, um, you can get the star formation rate, and so on. Um, and then you get maps like you see down here. And this, for example, is the metallicity distribution. Blue means low metallicity, red means well around solar metallicity. So this, so this is a, a galaxy that at most has solar metallicity. And you see this GRB up here. Um, was in a low metallicity region, actually disputed GRB <laughs> because it had four seconds duration. <laughs> so there we are at the, at the problem of the, of the separation between long and short. Um, and this is just to illustrate that if you go to higher redshifts um, and you're using your same spectrograph, your, your um, same instrument, even an imaging mechanism, um, get scale, you scale down a lot in, in uh, angular resolution. And then, for example, here, if you go from redshift 0.9 to redshift 0.5, you mm -hmm. wouldn't really say that the GRB is in the low metallicity region anymore because you start to thin over too many regions. And then you, it's very difficult to say anything about, say, the H2 region, actually, where the thin is. This really doesn't like me today. OK, I'm just going to talk about a few um, well, exceptional bursts that we have. Uh, GFEs that we have or objects that we have observed um, in the last years. That's why I told you to look at this uh, the synchrotron spectrum uh, that we had in the beginning. So a normal GFP has a synchrotron spectrum as an afterglow. This guy had not. This is called the Christmas burst because it exploded on um, Christmas Day 2010. This actually had a very long duration, 2000 seconds at least. Could have been more because the satellite entered um, um, entered a region where it couldn't observe because it has a, a lower Earth orbit. Um, and so what we observed was uh, here you see a, an SED, so spectral energy distribution evolving. Um, you see this is not a synchrotron spectrum. This is a kind of black body, um, so cooling and expanding black body. Um, here you see the light curve. Also, here the light curve is gray, where you have these dips that you still have not explained. Do they know they're real or not? Um, there's no observations here because of the, when the satellite could have observed, not because of the observations. Um, and it's, um, so we observed something that was a, a, a cooling, expanding black body instead of a synchrotron emission um, from something that was obviously a DRD. Um, and we observed some very late, very faint supernova at some point, like people didn't trust the supernova. Um, and then later on, the host galaxy. So we actually, much later, um, went and got spectra of the host galaxy um, and determined that it had a region of open gates. Um, yes, and so we did a model of that. The next slide. Um, so we did a model where they were actually done by a, by a colleague that had developed that like 10 years before. And he said like, this could work in that case, um, that you have a system of a helium star and a neutron star, um, and the neutron star in spirals on the helium star. And of course, when they collapse, you produce a GMB. Um, and during the in spiral, this system ejects a shell of, a thick shell of, of mass, let's say one or two years before, um, before the final coalescence in order for this model to work, or for this situation to work. Um, and then the jet is actually interacting with the way, my, in our model, it was not a, a, a real shell, it was a shell with an opening at the, at the, at the axis. Um, and when the final GRB happens, you have the GRB jet interacting with, let's say, the, the walls of this slightly thinner thing on the, on the polar axis. And that thermalizes the photons 
<coughs> um, and so what you observe in the end is basically um, a plume of material coming out that resembles a cooling and expanding magma. <clears throat> All right. This was another, well, not a very peculiar GRB, but it had a peculiar feature in the beginning that also has been predicted some years before. Um, so in the very early phase, we observed some kind of black body emission that looked very strange. We actually could take a spectrum very early on and found material with a very high um, expansion velocity. So you had something coming out with something that's not the expansion velocity of a supernova, which is in the highest cases, 10, 20,000 kilometers per second, not 100,000. Um, so this was not a supernova because this was way too early. This was like a, a day after the explosion. Usually the supernova um, comes up, you start to see it maybe a week after explosion because this, the GRB afterglow is so bright that in the beginning it completely outshines the supernova because the supernova reaches the peak, um, not an explosion, but a few weeks later because of the radioactive decay of the thing. Um, and you first have the, the GRB to fade enough to see the other part coming up. Um, so this was not a supernova, this was something else. And the composition was very strange. It was very rich in, in iron and nickel type of material. Um, so this is not what comes in the, in the shell of the supernova, so it must be something that's ejected from the inside of the star, because this is the last elements that are kept produced um, in the in nuclear synthesis before the star explodes. Um, and so our explanation was that we were lucky because the GRV was relatively faint intrinsically that we could observe the, a kind of cocoon of material that's ejected from the inside of the star which in most cases is also outshined by the normal synchrotron radiation that you have with the GRB, and in that case, you don't actually work for that. Um, well, this is a, an example of a very weird type of transient that you can still not explain that why you still haven't published yet. Um, the so-called um, 2018 COW, also called the COW, because, because it got the, the name from the, from the well, it wasn't the list of discovery. Um, you see here an SED that could look like a, well, like a GRB thing with different um, uh, synchrotron, um, well, synchrotron spectra with different breaks, and some of a main uh, black body here. Um, but it actually did some modeling and it doesn't fit to any GRB model. So it's a weird type of, of transient. Um, we have some lines in the spectrum where you have a very nice set of, of spectra from very early days to like two and a half months after. Um, we have some lines appearing, disappearing. There's probably some kind of interaction with the thermocellar medium going on. Um, and there has been now other maybe similar things discovered called uh, fast blue optical transients. So they rise very fast, much faster than a normal supernova. But they seem to be a very diverse set of, um, of explosions. So what can we learn from the host galaxy since I said that well, probably directly observing the progenitor is going to be tricky in the future. Um, well, as I said already, one of the problems is that they're mostly dwarf galaxies. That's also problematic to observe the host galaxy, for it, especially if you want to observe the entire resolution. Um, they usually have low metallicities, the one of low GRBs, and a high specific star formation. So that points to a very young, massive star exploding that has to have low metallicity um, as a progenitor of this kind of object. So here's just a comparison between yeah, what the uh, our GRB host looks like. You can have nearby GRB host. This is your typical GRB host size. This is the largest GRB host we have seen so far in the nearby universe. This is about Milky Way size. So we have this, uh, this object here, which I'm studying, which is a nice spiral galaxy, but this is even small compared to uh, this one, or Milky Way. But then your typical host is like some more things here. And while short GRBs, we knew before that the short GRBs must be different objects, also because the host galaxies are different. Um, 
So because the model was always around that it was coalescence of two neutron stars, um, we thought that they should occur usually in old galaxies, so elliptical galaxies, also called late type uh, early type galaxies. Um, but actually only a small percentage of them are real early type galaxies. Most of them are late type galaxies, so that are galaxies that are still actively forming stars. Um, although um, we are finding out that the, when these late type galaxies are not the supermassively high star forming galaxies that we see for long years, they do still form stars, um, but not, not to a huge amount. And the problem is also that um, well, some of them cannot be identified with a host. Uh, some have not found a host. Um, the problem is if you have a coalescence of two compact objects, those two neutron stars have to have had a supernova at some point. And what currently often can happen is when you have um, the supernova explosions, your system can get, get kicked out of the galaxy. So where the thing actually coalesced in the end might be far away from your host galaxy. Um, and if you don't have a redshift of the actual object, which we only have currently like three or four, you cannot identify later on 100% which is your host galaxy. You can say, okay, you have an object that is, if you calculate the energies, it might fit with the redshift, but we don't know what was it this blob, was it the other blob, was it the next blob. Um, so it's often very difficult to find um, host galaxies. And they're also usually not on uh, well, the sites where the exploration not correlated to the blue light of the galaxy, and they are well, found in much higher offsets from the host galaxy. So they, they seem to be a different thing. Okay. Um, well, supernova and supernova hosts are also mostly found in uh, well, dwarf galaxies with lower velocity. That's why we thought maybe they have a still a progenitor. The supernova and supernova type one, the type two hosts seem to be somewhat different. But it seems that these galaxies are much more extreme than GRB hosts. They are extreme emission galaxies. That's what we're looking at. These are galaxies that, um, well, they, at some point they were called, at a certain regime, they're called these famous green pea galaxies because their oxygen three line is very bright. It's a very high equivalent width. Um, but if you do that at different redshift, they think it's not necessarily green, but you have a very high emission in, in oxygen three, which means you have a very high ionization. So we have very extreme star formation rates, much more extreme than for GRB hosts. And yeah, if you compare the, the host galaxies of these two, um, just the global host galaxy, you see that they're very different. Um, so this is a um, plot of metallicity. This here would be solar metallicity. This would be this is like 8.7, 7.7 would be a tenth solar metallicity. Here you have the stellar mass of the galaxy. Um, and here you have supplementing rate of stellar mass. And you see that GRBs occupy a region that's on average more metal rich and um, well, a bit larger galaxies than supernova and supernova hosts. Um, well, and this is a sample that we chose at some point um, to see what is the kind of comparison sample. Um, of dwarf galaxies that in principle could have similar properties to the GRB or supernova, supernova host, but they turn out um, not to be. And here the same with the, the supernova. Normal supernova, they, they like higher, higher Yes, well, it depends on the supernova. I, I haven't put that in that plot because otherwise you don't see anything. <laughs> For example, broadline 1C are usually up here close to solar metallicity. Um, and yeah, these past blue optical transients, they seem to be a well, sort of very mixed bag of, of things. So this here is uh, the ATP and ATP tau again, uh, with some image in, in optical from the Gantzkopi Canarias and ALMA, so it's, it's radio. And the object is consistent or, or, or coincident with some blob in, uh, in, in CO emission. Um, here there's a map of the metallicity, and it actually has rather high metallicity. Um, this is another object that one of my students worked on together with people in the, in the US, 2080 GP, which was also a fast blue optical transient, which is in a dwarf galaxy, and it actually has um, low metallicity. 
everything is set down here on Galaxy. And here you have, again, a comparison like before, um, Telemos versus uh, Mechanicity. And here, yeah, there are some broad line ones here, here that you can ask before. And I thought they actually have, well, they have any kind of mechanism. You can see they have between 8.0 and 8.8. .8, so the blue dots are broad, normal broad line ones here that are not, that have not shown a GMB. Um, but so this one is off of any of these populations. So this we don't know yet. We don't know yet whether they're the same thing, whether they are different objects that just all rise very fast and show that similar properties. Um, and yeah, what I said before, maybe the FRBs might be connected to the fast ready burst, might be connected to supernovae and supernovae. So then, of course, the host galaxies should be somehow similar. Um, there is still a lot of observational bias because there's not a lot of host galaxies detected of these fast radio bursts, which is an observational problem because they have been detected with big radio arrays, but the localization is usually very bad. So it's very difficult to pinpoint in which galaxy this one um, has occurred. Usually, the only it's possible for us what we call repeating fast radio burst. So the same object is emitting these, uh, these flares and radio several times. Um, and then you can actually try to point with a radio telescope that has much more resolution. Um, and then you can pinpoint the host galaxy. And so if we um, compare, like here you have again the velocity of star formation rate. Um, and the, so the, the dots, this is the circles that we had before in the, in the two plots that I showed. And this is in the top of my GRB is a supernova, supernova, and you can see here the distribution of FRB hosts. Hmm. Yeah, they really do not look like supernova, supernova hosts. Maybe more like GRB hosts. And here they don't seem to be in any of them. They are too metal rich for being a supernova, supernova. Um, so yeah, there is still a lot of research going on. I mean, the fast range of Earth people are publishing like crazy all the time, and they're doing a massive effort right now to try to localize a lot of them much better, so that hopefully something of the working house that much better. And then maybe we can see whether they have any connection to put on the supernova. So the, the idea was, or the theory is, maybe you have a supernova in a supernova with a magnetar, you produce a magnetar, and Maybe only some years later or some decades later, these magnetars that have still a very strong magnetic field, um, they are capable of producing these fast radio bursts. So, would, so people have been searching for a um, fast radio burst in a location where before you have been detecting supernova and supernova. That has not been successful so far, also is a problem because supernova and supernova have not been, been detected that long ago, fast radio bursts neither. But maybe in 10 years from now, we start to detect the first ones, or maybe they kind of come from different type of objects. We, we don't know. Okay, and so, well, if you're lucky and you're in the, in the more local universe, which is something that um, I like to do, is not only observe the global host and properties, but um, to actually get down to the, to the properties, ideally of the star from region around the, around the, the GRB or the supernova. And see what are the properties of that of those sites. And well, here are um, here are two examples. So this is one that you had already seen before. This was a, a map of the velocity and star formation rate of this controversy. Unfortunately, this thing is overlying the, the name of the GRB. It's GRB of 60505, so from 2006, May 2006, in a dwarf spiral galaxy, which you see not that well here, but it's a dwarf spiral. Um, and as I said, the, the GRB exploded in a low metallicity region and high star forming region. And this is actually a very controversial GRB because as I said before it had a four second duration. So people are saying the long is a short GRB. The additional problem is we did not detect a supernova, coincidentally. And it was low enough redshift to perfectly detect it, but it was not there. There was no supernova. Um, and so I went and studied the host. And well, as you see, the site looks like a site where you would produce a very massive star, a low metallicity massive star, and that would be a progenitor of a long GRB, not of a short GRB. So I still stick to that. Now there are even people claiming that they have detected a kilonova, 
very low signal to noise, but I don't know, there's some tension between what you observe the environment and what you observe. Well, and, and hints from the actual explosion. So I mean, this is an open question. To me, this was a massive star explosion, but I, I can be convinced about that. Um, and this is a galaxy that I've also seen before. I told you this is a very nice uh, grand design spiral, but still smallish. Um, but it was close enough um, to make a very nice study in any kind of different wave bands and with different field spectroscopy. So you can actually get um well i don't i don't really show a map of, of the most resolution that there is <laughs> there's a so-called new spectrograph but you can get um the properties of like star formation rate metallicity um extinction age or whatever in a very uh, nice resolution using several pixels pixels per star in region um, and what I did here is to, well, this is not a map, but this is the physical distance from, from the center of the galaxy. And we know, for example, for a, a lot of star forming galaxies, we have a so called negative metallicity gradient. So the metallicity increases towards the outside of the galaxy. And you see here the GIB has a lower metallicity um, than it should have according to its location or its distance from the center. Um, here you have a specific star formation rate, so that's the star formation rate weighted by the luminosity that actually gives you an indication. Because if you have a massive star, worse massive star forming region, your total star formation rate is going to be higher, but it doesn't mean that it forms more stars <coughs> or has more ability to form stars. It just is larger, has more gas. So you want to weigh it with either the mass or the luminosity. Um, and so that's what I did here. And you see the GRB has a very high, this is the, the pixel on the GRB. This is the actual star formation uh, region of the GRB and you see it has the highest star forming, uh, specific star formation region. Of the and here's a map of the, of the age or one well, of the contribution of the light of the youngest star forming, um, uh, of the youngest thin of star formation to that star forming region. Uh, you have to actually model the spectrum for that, so that's why you have to downscale the resolution. And you see there, a, there are a few regions here which are very young. The most of the light comes from a very young stellar population, and a lot of the GFB. <coughs> no. Is this for, uh, for short? Sorry? Long and short GRB? No, these are both, well, this is, we don't know. <laughs> this was clearly a long GRB. But you said it's resolved in part. Yes. Uh, yes, short. I didn't put long. <laughs> okay, I, I have a, I think I kept the slide of the, of the short. Now, this was both long. Well, I told you this is, we don't know whether it's more short or long. I think it was long, and this is clearly a long. Um, well, I think I'm running without a time. Uh, well, this is maybe not too interesting. Um, and, uh, this is just a way of trying to find where the star formation comes from. Um, which is also still a mystery. Why do we suddenly have in this galaxy which looks like a nice average star forming, but not super star forming galaxy? Um, you suddenly get some bursts of star formation in a certain region that will produce a GAB. Um, and maybe the hint comes from longer wavelength observations, for example, um, or CO, or we actually find some hints in um, neutral, hy neutral hydrogen. Um, in a normal galaxy, this would be a nice disk. You see, this is not a disk, but a sort of double, double blob. So something must have happened to the, the H1 distribution in that galaxy. Maybe it was interacting with the prior order. Um, yeah, and you can also see the, the impact of the extreme star formation on the B host. This is a study that there was my last paper, actually, um, where I did a high angular resolution and high spectral resolution study uh, with one spectrograph of BMT. Um, and then you can resolve, for example, emission lines, this is the alpha emission lines and you see it's in a normal standard warm gas that just illuminated by some stars, you will get a nice um, one single Gaussian, but we get actually a double Gaussian with a narrow component and a broad component. And the broad component probably comes from um, well, either winds or expanding blobs. Um, and that's an indication for, for heavy star formation going on. 
Um, so you can do this, a similar thing for supernovae and supernovae, which is that the two examples of supernovae and supernova have one, both of them. This is one of the most extreme uh, holes that you've ever observed for TK4 gum. Uh, very nice spectrum. It's not super resolved. You only took two long field spectrum. I'm trying to get IFU data from that for a while, but I haven't been accepted yet. And it's a very, very, very young galaxy. If you look at it, you have a very flat spectrum. Usually you have some bumps here from the calcium or whatever, and some shape. This is completely flat. And if you zoom in, you see that you see the Balma series in emission down to the very end. That means that it's super, super young. Because as soon as you have a few older stars, you start to see the Balma lines in absorption. You have some underlying, well, the, the higher Balma order are going to be in absorption and even up to H beta or H alpha, you see some underlying absorption and then you start coming up. That was not the case in this one. So this is a very, very young stellar population. Um, and the other very interesting object was 2017 BGM, uh, work done by, by our by then postdoc with Maitso. And that was also a very controversial supernova uh, host because if you look at the galaxy and its global metallicity, this is also close enough to be in, in SDS and everything, it had a supersolar metallicity. And usually supernova and supernova hosts had very low metallicity, lower than GOD hosts. And so we got intrigued and um, here we actually use it. So we had our own data, but there was also very nice data from the manga survey um, coming out with the field spectra. And we did some stellar population modeling of the supernova site, which you see, of course. Um, and so there is, well, there is some older stellar population that contributes most of the mass and a lot of the light that's probably dominating if you observe just the galaxy itself. But there's also a young um, stellar population that actually has a low metallicity, which probably was a stellar population. So there was some starburst going on. Um, the galaxy is clearly disturbed. There's actually more starburst visibly here on that end, not on the end of the supernova, because it has a companion. This companion here, um, they have been interacting and you clearly see that they have this blue uh, color from, from uh, new star formation going on due to interaction on, on their opposite sides, respective opposite sides. Um, well, let me hop over this. So here's a uh, short GRB's result. Well, this was also just a sort of coarse resolution only with three different regions. Um, you see here, for example, this one has all the balmanites in absorption, the balmanite in absorption here. Um, even at the TRB side, so this is not particularly young. Star formation rate is well, maybe a bit higher than the Milky Way, but not much. Um, half solar metallicity, and if you compare it to other GFB hosts in this um, diagram, that's just four different emission lines in ratios. Uh, usually, the more extreme galaxies you find up here, long GFB hosts you mostly find up here. Um, and you see those are, well, this would be SDSS galaxies. It's more of an, an average star of the galaxy. So, not what you see in the long GFB hosts. And these are the only two, well, three <laughs> short GRBs with IFUs. Um, it's been done by someone working in Kaltenburg. Um, and you see, for example, here, this is, um, I think this was Lux and H out for a star formation rate, I don't remember. I think it's star formation rate. So you have here the, the host is this spiral galaxy and the afterglow is up here. And something where you have no H out values. So that's an H star. And the same in this, in this space. And this was the famous wave one, um, which is an old elliptical galaxy, although it has some kind of what we call dry merger. So it may be smaller the galaxy because we saw that spiral structure here in, in emission line uh, in the galaxy, but it's not, a, a, not related to any star from the region. Okay, then I jump over this. So I'm actually going to try to observe the progenitor of not of GRB and supernova, supernova, but of ordinary supernova, and not just in imaging, but actually in spectroscopy. I was lucky once in 2015, 2015 the age, which was in a nearby galaxy that we had observed before, and that had some outbursts 
of a long while because this is so nearby that it can actually go to an archive and see what has been going on on the position of the, of the object in 20 years before. And I got completely a spectroscopy. So this is a spectroscopy of the star two years before it exploded. This idea. Um, this is how it looked like uh, in 2018. Um, and you can model that star and you saw clearly that it was a luminous blue variable um, with a very high temperature, 10,000 Kelvin, and well, very luminous. So that was the first time in, since 1987A that we detected that we have spectra of uh, a supernova for data. So that's something that I would have been doing now extensively if I would have gotten the ERC two years ago. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't happen. Um, so I'm still trying to follow up the project, but of course I have, as you know, at the moment I have no personal research to do that. Um, so I'm trying to get or mostly use integral field data of, um, of nearby uh, galaxies and try to extract spectra of stars. You can do something about the we call crowding. So you have a lot of objects on top of each other. If you use an HST image as comparison, you can do something. And we actually have two examples in the same galaxy, surprisingly, um, two supernovae in 2019 and 2020, where we can actually uh, extract some uh, spectrum. Here we are not sure if you put that in an HR diagram in a region where it should not be. So we think this one, which is very close to the center of the galaxy, might be a superposition of different stars. Um, and another one was serendipitously observed 48 hours before the supernova was announced. And you go to the site and you see some broad feature coming here up on top of the of the HR. So maybe we caught, well, not the progenitor, but the earliest supernova spectrum. <clears throat> and yeah, I guess I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, out sorry. of time. So this is just a very short glimpse. So what I said before, if you have, um, when you have a quasar, you have to, to subtract the intrinsic structure in order to study the matter in, in one either the host galaxy or in the sideline. Um, in a GRB, you don't have that problem. And what you can get is nice spectra like this one. This was a GRB at rate 2.7, so sort of moderate. Um, this is the x shooter spectrograph. It had three arms from the UV to the, to the infrared. And you see everything from the, well, where the, the, it all disappears because there's too much hydrogen absorption. You see the, the what we call Lyman Alpha Forest, actually not, well, of the Lyman Alpha Forest in general in the sideline and the different Lyman Alpha and Beta and Gamma, whatever absorptions of systems that are in the sideline to us, which is actually a crazy system, although it was for us already below it to 2.7, we had nine intervening systems. So that's galaxies that are in the sideline by chance between the GRB and us. And you can study not only the GRB host and the sideline inside the GRB host, but also the sideline in all these galaxies. And then you get a nice spectrum like this one with a lot of absorption lines. And you see that the spectrum, the intrinsic spectrum is very flat. Um, all these traps here is infrared, infrared. It's not very nice observing because we have only bands on the atmosphere that cannot be collected. So then you can do, and you can. Uh, I think we should. Yeah. Also, we have some time for questions. So yeah. Just go with a few seconds. So you can can do a lot of things with it. For example, determine the metallicity, um, how to draw the high redshift, um, and it's surprisingly flat. So even at higher redshift, the metallicity was actually rather high already. Maybe there's some indication of the line strength going down in high redshift. And you can also study quantum kinematics, as you saw here. So the absorption lines actually are not just smooth um, absorption lines, but you have some kind of structure here, and that can give you a lot of information on the different gas uh, properties and, and the gas gas in, in the system. You can determine distances from it. And my student also has done that the first time now for a short GRB. And I said there is very few short GRBs where we have redshift because it's very difficult to observe when the afterglows are fainter. So it has been actually very challenging to get spectra from a GRB, short GRB after the Okay, now I leave out this one. And um, most of nothing, we have time to say much about cosmology. Of course, since GRBs go out to very high redshift, you would like to use them for cosmology. 
um, that has been, of course, tried for many years. There is one of these the most promising relations that's called the, the Latin relation with peak ISO. So that's the, the peak in the high energy related to the total energy release. Um, you can make some sort of Hubble diagram, but you see that you have a very, very, very dark spot. What you can do is use gravitational wave signals to determine H0, um, but that has only been possible once at an object that had a distance of 40 megahertz. So we cannot do that. So I'll jump over this one and give you the picture from yesterday night at the same place, so it was me yesterday night. Um, and yeah, so I hope I've shown you that different. Uh, well, the host of different stellar explosions are indeed different, that they might give us some hints on the theories are not being true of relation between different objects and different explosions. But we can actually get some information from that. Um, that you have to study the immediate environment, that's the most reliable thing. Um, yeah, we need to get very good correlations on the environment and the progenitor in the local universe if we want to use it in the higher friendship universe. And we need more high redshift cosmological probes that can actually do reliable cosmology. Thank you very much. Not much time, we still have a few minutes for questions. Would like to ask you questions? Well, maybe I have a minute. Too many, so many options. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are the chances that uh, the super are instability or that's then you allow them to be for instability? That's a good question. What's I don't think it's whether well, they can be parent stability supernova. Sorry? But that can be parent stability supernova. I don't know whether it has been completely ruled out. But I think the magnetar model is currently favored. Yeah, because it's the I'm personally not too convinced that we have to take the appearance of the super love project. <laughs> well, that's my uh, a note that 23 years ago, 1999, people didn't know nothing at all about the obvious. So I remember people discussing the stem from uh, our own galaxy or from far away galaxy. It was almost nothing. That, that should have been longer ago because 98 we had the first well indication that well, we observed the supernova together I, with I, a longer I period. Yeah, but the first conclusive <laughs> now the first conclusive now the first redshift was already in yeah, 97, what, I think. What I want to mean is and that, that was that made it clear that it was not in our own galaxy, mm -hmm. but yeah. What I want to mean is that not far away ago. So we didn't know nothing and now and we can we use them for really those things. Yeah. And, and and no one knows anymore. If you now go to a if you have a new PhD student, no one has no idea of all the debates that have been going on 30 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I I, I precisely Live through the transition, so that's that's very nice. You know, mapping and know what was going on. And first detection and first galaxy, people could see what was the progenitor and say, Look, that's the progenitor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so If I may very quickly just ask one nice one, because I mean, I feel also with GRs that like gravity, is there like any, I suppose it's difficult. Well, are there any insights that you can gain more on that field from observations, so generally speaking? 
of general <coughs> sorry of general relativity well i mean just just uh, anything that that can especially affect uh, the the view uh, in that way well, what do you observe in the grb itself um has not that much to do with the black hole that you're forming okay i think the ones that can give you more answers on that are the um, gravitational wave people because there you can probe things that you cannot probe with like magnetic radiation. So they all what we observe for gamma ray bursts are usually related to well anything that comes out of a jet. To infer things from the central engine, so we call it central engine because we don't know what it is what's actually going on. Um, where for example, these things can I said that usually the case has smooth power law. Um, that's not the case. So it has flares, especially in the, in the very beginning. And now doing with a project with actually a student in Czechia, um, trying to get, well, trying to model the very early observations, which are tricky because you actually have to observe seconds after you detect the, <clears throat> the actual GRB. There are satellites that do that. So the main satellite detecting GRBs right now is called SWIFT because it has a UV telescope on board, um, but it does not always detect um, the very early afterglow. Mm -hmm. And you also want to see what's going on in longer wavelengths. And for that, you need, at the moment, you need ground based telescopes. So, what we do is you have a robotic telescope that just reacts, it automatically gets the signal from the, from the satellite. It says there has been a detection here. Um, usually, detection is good if it's also detected in X rays, then you have a few arc seconds of error circuits where you can point the normal telescope. Mm -hmm. It gets the thing smooth automatically, it will open the dome, smooth, whatever, and within seconds you can be on the GRB. So there's someone in Czechia who has a, they're working with the, the Oshie telescope also, they detect cosmic rays and follow up those um, events. Um, and they're also using them for, for GRBs. And, and so they have early data and they do a lot of things. So for example, you can see the onset of the afterglow. So if you look very early, you actually don't have a decayed first rises a bit and then decays. It can often have flares that can reach very high magnitude compared to the average magnitude of your afterglow. Um, and that's a big question, what is going on? Mm -hmm. Is it related to stuff that this afterglow is slamming into? Like what the first um, suggestion was, you have a flare because the thing slams into a dense cloud or something. First, the theorist said no, now they say it could be. Um, it could be something that's suddenly the, your central engine is doing something new, but that might just be the accretion. Um, something happening in the accretion, and then in the jet, you get a new layer of or new energy input. Mm -hmm. We don't know. But there are a lot of theorists working on it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No, then let's talk and speak again. If you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe.